How do you feel about vigilantism? Taking the law into your own hands. Seeking what you perceive to be justice. Now, obviously I'm not talking about Batman, who frawls the streets in his spare time looking to put wrongs to right. This is the story of Corinna Smith and how she saw what she perceived to be justice against her husband of 31 years. And obviously, before we get into it, the disclaimers are a must. This is a true crime. It's a real story involving real people. So although I do want you to share it and I do want you to comment, please do be sensitive as you do so. When Karina Smith was 21 year old, she married Michael Baines. Now Michael Baines was a lot older than Karina, 21 years older, making him about 43 year old. I mean, that is just incredible. Imagine your daughter at 21 year old coming home saying she's gonna marry a 43 year old. There's a big age gap between me and my missus, but 22 years is a big gap. However, their marriage had generally been a happy one. Even in later years when the age gap started to show and they weren't doing as much together and it put a bit of strain on the marriage, but they were still fairly happy. And then looking back in hindsight, Karina says that Michael displayed some controlling behaviour towards her, but she always used to just put up with it. The family and friends regarded them as a normal couple. They experienced ups and downs, but that is married life. And Karina herself, all the way to the end, loved Michael very deeply. Karina had already been married before she married Michael, and so had he. They both had children from previous relationships, and they had one child together as well. A particular hard time in their life was when Karina's son Craig took his own life in 2007. He'd been deeply troubled before his death, and he'd been to prison for a serious assault. The entire family struggled to understand why Craig's life had taken the course and taken the path that he did. He explained to his mom that the man that had attacked him was a, a file, the P word, and that he touched him inappropriately. Then on the day before Craig's death, he'd been really distressed, and he said to Corinna, Mom, he's a, that word again. The next day, the day of his death, he did seem happier, and nothing else was mentioned about what he'd said that previous night. As his mom, Corinna had always blamed herself for his death. She had no reason to, but in all honesty, I think that's quite a common reaction to have. With all that said, it was in 2020 that this case really started to take hold. And I should also add, at this point in their life, Corinna is recognised as Michael's carer, as well as his wife, obviously. On Monday the 13th of July, 2020, Corinna had spent the day with her daughter. In all, they'd both had a really good day, they were both happy, and time was getting on a bit, but Corinna didn't want to go home just yet. She wanted to spend more time with her daughter at her house. So she phoned her husband up and told him that that's what she intended to do. But her husband weren't all that happy with that. He moaned and grumbled a bit. He just, in all, weren't very happy about it. Her daughter could detect a bit of friction going on. And at this point, I think her daughter had just had enough. And she said that she should tell Michael that he tells her what he's done or she's going to tell her what he's done. Now, this weren't the first time that her daughter had hinted that there was something to be said. But this time, Corinna wouldn't let it drop. She wanted to know what needed to be said. She insisted that her daughter opened up and got it off her chest. And that's when her daughter broke down. For the first time, her daughter opened up and told her mom that her husband, Michael, had abused her and Craig for many years. Now, because of the rules of YouTube, I've had to simplify that. But I'm pretty sure you understand what I mean. This abuse were many, many years ago. And I'm sure you get what type of abuse this was. But let's not just fly through this part. Because it is an extremely huge moment for Corinna's daughter. It's a scary thing to come forward and expose. Especially after such a long time. There's all sorts of fears and doubts that you can be believed. But it's also a massively huge thing for Corinna to process. The whirlwind of thoughts rushing through her head all of a sudden must have been immense. And let's not forget that she's still living with and married to this alleged monster. To say the very least, her daughter was distressed and she was in shock. Her daughter shared very limited detail, but she did say a few things. First of all, she expressed how hard it were and how bad it was that she couldn't open up and tell her. But she also made some very serious allegations about what had happened with Craig. Corinna's other son. And she told her that it was because of this 
that he'd taken his own life. Now, obviously, not only is Corinna trying to process all this information, but everything that's ever happened in their family life must have been now flashing in front of her eyes. Not least of all, what Craig said to her the day before he took his own life. All the dots must have been connecting. And again, let's not play this down. Corinna's settling emotion to all this information were described as being livid and fuming at the thought of what's been done to them. But it's not only what's been done to them, it's also the fact of what it ended up doing to the son. And honestly, I can't describe the earth-moving feeling I get when I'm writing something like this. It's not anger, it's... You can't describe the thought of someone doing that sort of stuff, finding out this information, it can't be described. It is like anger and so many other higher level emotions packed into it. And I've, I've got to admit, I kind of disconnect myself when I'm writing things like this. It stops making sense, it's just words, and I write it without any emotion. But even I struggled to not feel that emotion in this. Because I say earth moving, because I really would split the earth in half if this was me. And as I said, let's not forget what unforgivable things have been done to the things that she loved the most, but also the long-lasting effect that that had had. The fact that she'd lost a loved son because of that. That surely got to make things even worse in a situation where things can't get worse. But unlike me writing this case, Corinna couldn't block this out. It was real to her, and she was in the middle of this absolute nightmare scenario. Everyone's worst nightmare. Her obvious first reaction was to call the police, but her daughter didn't want her to, at least not right away. What her daughter wanted was to get a polygraph test. That could prove that she was telling the truth, and then she could tell her family, because she had this massive fear that if she went round telling the rest of her family, they wouldn't believe her, and that it'd ruin and divide the family. At least if she had this polygraph, she could prove that she weren't making it up. And just to clarify here, it's the daughter that's suggesting a polygraph test, not Corinna. So the plan was made. They agreed. The daughter was going to take a polygraph test. The plan also included Corinna trying to get her husband to attend the test so he too could be tested. They found a company, they booked the test, and Corinna even paid £600 for an advance booking fee. And by the way, this was all on the same day. Well, it was 8 o'clock at night. An hour and a half later, at half past nine, Corinna was taken home. I, d I have no idea how she managed to go home, because I'm telling you something I wouldn't be able to. But she did, and once she got home, she phoned her son. And despite her daughter's wish, Corinna told her son in an extremely emotional way about these allegations that had been met. But as quite often is the case, the son just refused to believe him. So after that call, she again phoned her daughter. And obviously, her daughter's quite upset and angry now. She's made her mom book this polygraph test on the premise that they won't tell anybody till after that, but she's gone straight home and told her son. As, as we said, the reason she wanted that test was because she knew people wouldn't believe her. It was an hour after that last call that Corinna attacked her husband. Now, the way she attacked him is incredibly incredibly brutal and let's not split hairs here it's outright evil but honestly i don't think she intended to kill him it took corinna about 13 minutes to pour three one kilogram bags of sugar into a bucket she boiled the kettle twice pouring each kettle full of water into the bucket corinna had made a very hot sticky syrup meanwhile michael was upstairs sleeping i'm gonna leave it there i imagine you can understand what happened while he was sleeping um but as a result of this attack he sustained serious burns to 36 percent of his body i believe the majority of those burns were to his torso and to his arms corinna later said that she must have been aiming for his private parts but the evidence shown at court basically suggested otherwise. After the attack that night, Corinna ran out of the house and ran to a neighbour's house. Now, 
when I read that, I automatically thought it was like the next door neighbours or someone across the road. But she actually ran to an house nine doors up, which is quite a long way off. And it turns out she weren't even particularly close to this neighbour. When she got to this house, she banged on the door continuously until they opened the door. And when they did, she said, I hurt him real bad. I think I've killed him. The neighbour then contacted the police and the ambulance. And from around this part, a video was shown to the court that showed that she was in a very distressed state, as you would be. But although that does sound obvious, this does show it weren't something that was cold and calculated. She'd done it probably on the back of adrenaline, and then now she's like, oh my god, I've done it. She, she's really distressed and really struggling to cope with everything, really. A short time later, officers arrived at the address, which is in Neston in Cheshire. When they did, they found Michael in excruciating pain, and he was whimpering in bed. I'm not going to say anything about his skin, because I'll probably get demonetised, but if you know anything about sugary liquid burns, then you can probably understand the incredibly bad state that his skin were in. He told the officers, I'm badly burnt. I'm burnt all over. She poured boiling water all over me. I just want to die. He was taken to Whiston Hospital in the early hours of Tuesday the 14th of July 2020. He was in a very serious condition. And then 37 days later, after numerous surgeries and skin grafts and everything else, on the 19th of August 2020, Michael Baines died in hospital. Karina was originally arrested and charged with grievous bodily harm. Then shortly after Michael's death, she was charged with murder. In police interviews, she said, I accept that I poured boiling water over Michael with sugar in it. The whole thing is a bit of a blur. Minutes became seconds. I just lost it and was so emotional. I was not acting out of revenge. I don't know how long after the incident that interview were, but the very line, I was not acting out of revenge, seems like a very interesting line to me. So, on with the court. Karina didn't have any previous convictions. She'd never been in any kind of trouble before. By all accounts, she'd been a kind, loving person. She'd done lots of charity work, and the judge recognised that her actions that night were completely out of character. She was on trial for murder, so the only sentence that's applicable is a live sentence. The starting point for the minimum term was 15 years, and then there were the aggravating factors. And they were that Michael was an old man. He wasn't in his best health, and she was his carer. He was in bed at home at the time of the attack, which obviously also branches out to him being vulnerable, but the judge pointed out here that he were desperately trying not to overcount. Another aggravating factor was the deliberate mixing of the hot sugary solution. That in itself showed a level of planning, and it was designed to cause significant physical suffering. The judge then used that to point out that he wasn't sentencing her on the fact that she tried to kill him. He was sentencing her on the fact that she tried to cause serious harm. He then extended on from that, saying that he knows that she was in a state of distress, and it wasn't a long-held and carefully formed plan. In mitigation, the judge accepted that she was in acute stress state at the time of the attack, and since then has displayed symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. However, the judge also said that he didn't deem it that she'd lost control. Her age and a previous good character were also considered as mitigating factors. The unusual feature of this case called for a careful balancing. It is possible to have sympathy for the situation you found yourself in, while still condemning your actions. On the one hand, the shocking revelations made by your daughter undoubtedly led to your uncharacteristic violence. Against that, you made the deliberate choice to inflict horrific injury and took calculated action to do just that. Aside from the dreadful physical pain you caused Mr. Baines, your actions have caused yet more pain and suffering for your families. This is perhaps best summed up by your son, who will struggle to make sense of what happened. He concluded that your actions, although very wrong, were an emotional reaction to the devastating information you had just received. I cannot put it any more eloquently than that. Karina Smith was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 12 years. Now, I really want to read something out that the judge said early on in court, because I think at first glance you can see this and a lot of people will think, good, or a lot of people will say, well, I'd have done the same. But I think what the judge says really puts it into context. Your trial could not and did not explore the truth of the allegations made against your husband. The prosecution accepted that the allegations were made 
and that you believe them. No doubt the revelations were extremely distressing for you. I accept that. Over the course of that afternoon and into the evening, you connected things in your mind that left you convinced that your daughter was telling the truth. Killing Mr. Baines also took away any opportunity for the allegations to be tested. That took away his right to a fair trial, bearing in mind that everyone is innocent until proven guilty. It also took away the right of your daughter to have her allegations heard and deprived other family members of having the chance to establish the truth. I think that really hits home and it sums up this kind of vigilantism. Now, by no means am I saying those allegations were true or false. However, we do supposedly live in a country where your innocence will proven guilty. And on top of that, the state don't usually pursue cases against the deceased. So not only did Michael die an innocent man, but that also steals away a lot from the alleged victim or victims. There is also a petition on change.org. It's entitled Release Lower Sentence for Corinna Smith. And I've just noticed that on the sentencing statements by the judge, Corinna is spelt differently to what it is on the petition. I didn't check who made the petition. Maybe I should. The petition was started one year ago and at the time of recording this, it's got 10,000 signatures. That's all I've got for you. And there's quite a lot of cases like this where a parent goes out and kills somebody because of alleged abuse. There's one that always comes to mind where there's this guy in court and he stands up very proudly and says, yeah, I did it and I'd do it again. Now, obviously, I don't condone any sort of violence or murder. We're going to leave that there. And we're just going to move straight on to the advice. I've got one good bit of advice. But before I do, we need to do the disclaimer again. Because remember, Michael was never found guilty of what he was alleged. So whether you believe it or not, bearing in mind, we don't know him. And we don't know the daughter. So let's just know that it's an allegation and nothing more. But the disclaimers are, these are real people. They have real families. Bearing in mind, Michael's kids are saying he's innocent. Corinna's daughter is saying he's not. So no matter what you put here, no matter who you've been horrible to, there is people that can be offended. And this is real life. So just be very careful of what you're saying. That doesn't mean you can't have free speech, but just be careful about what you're saying about people, yeah? Don't forget you can still get done for slander or defamation or whatever. So my advice is, whenever you're angry or upset or highly emotional for whatever reason, do not act. Something that I've, I always do, if I'm angry with my parents or my missus, or anybody like that, what I do is I get my notepad out of my phone and I write down why I'm angry, all the key parts of it and everything else. Now that might sound like some sort of therapy stuff that I'd usually say I'll sod that to, but that really helps. And there's a reason that really helps. Because you don't have to send a message there and then. You don't have to go and confront them there and then. The message is there. So when you've calmed down, you'll still be able to see all the reasons you were really angry. And when you're calmer, then you'll be able to address it. And I'm not saying, oh, well, don't act on out ever. What I'm actually saying is don't act in that moment when you're angry. Emotions make you and everybody else irrational. There's a good chance that if you're angry in that moment, you will act and then later regret it. If once you've calmed down, you look at the notes and then you decide that you want to do something stupid, then... That's what's going to happen. It's fair enough. It were on you. But there's a good chance that once you've calmed down, you'd think whatever you were going to do is very extreme. And that is the best advice I can give you. It takes a little bit of willpower, but I think that willpower in that sense is called maturity. Write down your thoughts. Write down your feelings. It doesn't have to be an eloquent letter. You don't have to send it to anybody. Well, you shouldn't send it to anybody. And then half an hour later, when you've calmed down a bit, look at it. Or when you've sobered up, whatever else, then you can look at it, then you can act on it. And with that bit of advice being said, I'm going to leave you to it. Obviously, love to all of their children. They're the ones that have been affected by this, and I can't wait to hear what you think about this case down in the description. Just remember, I don't, you, your thoughts, your comments are very, very welcome. Just don't be outright nasty to anybody, because there's no need for it. And on that note, with that advice being said, I'm going to leave it there. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys think about this absolutely crazy case. All I'm saying is, I love you. Take care of yourselves. Take care of those around you. And I'll see you next week. Bye.